Let me ask you to turn with me to the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 2. I bring you greetings from Winston-Salem and our congregation there. We pray for you as we pray for all our works and sister churches. and We trust you remember us as well. I want to read together uh, what closes with some familiar words and then I'll say a little more about our text uh, after we pray. I had some wrestlings with what to preach. It's around the holidays, but we're, I guess, getting a little closer to New Year's than Christmas. You know, I don't know if you're among those that have to already be undecorated, but um, Christmas is gone, and the New Year will probably go faster than the last. But um, I thought of a Christmas message. I thought of Preaching out of 1 Peter, we've been in the last several months, a little over a year, I guess, looking in our own church at the life of the Apostle Peter, and then just about to finish his first epistle, couldn't quite fit it into 2019, so 2020 we'll see a little bit of 1 Peter as well, and we'll perhaps be there this evening. But I want to read to you this morning from Jeremiah, and we'll begin in the first verse of the second chapter, and read down through to the 13th verse, Jeremiah 2 and verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity of your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord. And with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Kittim and see and send a to Keter and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be ye horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water. Well, amen. We'll end our reading there and trust the Lord to add His blessing to the public reading of His inspired Word. And let's do with the Word open before us, bow our heads and our hearts together. Ask the Lord to help us as we consider His Word today. Our Heavenly Father, we enter Your presence again mindfully, and we come asking that You will grant us the help of Your Spirit that we need to preach Your Word, to hear Your Word, to live Your Word. And so we come asking that You will help us to put aside the distracting thoughts, Lord, our varied responsibilities, worthy things, Lift us above the temporal. Help us to know truly a Sabbath day where being mindful of eternal things, we're helped when it comes to things temporal. So again, we pray 
for your spirit to be known in this place in these moments now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach to you today a message that I have preached not merely once, but several times before. I think it was first in the year 2003, and I have frankly preached what I want to share with you today almost everywhere that I've gone since then. In recent years, I have, I guess, waned from preaching this everywhere that I go. But as I thought about preaching this Lord's Day, and again, my direction initially was toward where I've been preaching at home in 1 Peter. But I just couldn't seem to get peace. And as I thought, and I had the benefit of modern technology, I logged on to sermonaudio.com and uh, looked myself up. I don't do that very often. It's too discouraging. But uh, I was able to search by this church and by this speaker, and lo and behold, this message didn't show up here. And to be honest, I was a little bit surprised. But I thought, well, perhaps it is indeed something I should bring here. What I want to speak to you today on is important. If it weren't important, I wouldn't preach it in a lot of different places. It's actually a little contrary to my nature and my desires to preach old messages. Uh, it's too easy for a preacher to say, well, I'll just grab those notes and I'll go and, you know, the preparation just goes by the wayside, maybe a token prayer before you walk in the door. But this is one that, which I've taken up. If you remember our dear brother S.B. Cook, who came to lecture us some in homiletics and he actually paused one day to speak about preaching an old message, warned us a little bit of those dangers of laziness and sloth, but then encouraged us that if there is a word that the Lord has given you, if you have searched something out that is important, then it may be that it should be preached more than one time and in more than one place. It's also a message that I have attached a title to that is an, a title that attempts to get attention. It's a little catchy one. They asked me in the back before I walked in what the title was so they can get ahead on their notes for sermon audio. I told them the title and the response was, well, that's clickbait. Wow. I was expecting a little more. Um, maybe you're like I uh, am and seek to avoid clickbait and those things that entice us to click the mouse or the touchpad or whatever it is. My technological ignorance shows itself rapidly. But what I want to speak to you today on, I've entitled, Why Every Christian Should Believe in Many Gods. Now, I have not embraced polytheism. I've had to say this often because the first time I preached this message was in our own church. My wife was about 10 feet from me in that setting, and as can happen in the pulpit, when you're searching for a particular word, you can get a little flustered, and I just about came out with polygamy instead of polytheism. I was able to catch myself and say, and I can say happily today, I have not become a polytheist or a polygamist. So obviously, I'm not speaking about uh, abandoning orthodoxy but grasping attention. Because what I want to speak to you on today really is the subject of idolatry and our propensity to fashion God's, small g, of our own making and forsake the true God and run after these broken cisterns, as we'll see. So, please... Think with me on that truth, on that reality. I think idolatry is a theme that is so important, it is so fundamental, that we don't think enough about it. We assume we have that one under control. And all too often, we show that we don't. There are just four simple statements I want to make to you today on this theme. And the first statement is this. All men are worshipers. All men 
are worshipers. Now we could go around this room today or around the world and catalog an indefinite number of ways in which we are different one from another. We can see differences in race. We can see differences in our gender. We can see differences in our social standing. There's rich, there's poor. We see differences in our age. There's young, there's old. We can see differences in our physical characteristics. Some are strong, some are weak, some are healthy, some are infirm. We can see differences in our educational backgrounds. Some highly educated, some not educated at all. Differences in our skill sets. And we can go on and on with regard to the ways in which we're different one from another. But in this, we are all the same. We are all worshipers. Now we live in a pluralistic society. We live in a country where people pride themselves in their liberty to do various things and be distinct. But I submit to you, we can't run from this truth. No man can run from this truth. He is a worshiper. He's built that way. He's created that way. When you read Romans 1, that catalog of depravity and the condition of the natural man, and you come to that statement in verse 25 where it says, who changed the truth of God into a lie, or perhaps better there, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And again, you see all these things that Paul outlines and we see so vividly, sadly, on display in our society today. But it doesn't say when they rejected God and God gave them over to their own vile affections. God even gives them over to a reprobate mind. It doesn't say that they once were worshipers and then they ceased being worshipers. No, it says who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. All men are worshipers. Now, I guess that brings up the whole topic of worship. And we certainly can't go into that at any length today. But what we worship is what we ascribe worth to. It's what we glory in. I'm sure you've I had put before you before that one of the Old Testament terms that has to do with glory is essentially the word weight, something that's weighty, something that's significant. I'll see how many of you smile when I say this. Something that's heavy, man. I am just old enough to remember a some of the 60s and the early 70s, and the hippies spoke of things that were heavy. And they used the word correctly. What do you consider to be weighty? What do you consider to be significant enough to draw you unto it? What do you ascribe worth to? Well, that's what we worship what we delight in, what we're drawn towards. All men are worshipers. They take delight and are drawn toward something. Again, this is a theme that could take us a little further, but what about delight? What about pleasure and the pursuit of it? What do we find pleasure in? You see, the problem isn't in pleasure. The problem is in what we put our delight. Where do we seek pleasure? This is, I'm sure, a topic that brings up a host of things and not a few of them controversial. But one of the most significant books of the last generation is John Piper's Desiring God. And he speaks about the idea of a Christian hedonism. Of course, there's been a lot of 
discussion about that, and many really don't like that term at all. But I frankly worry about some that haven't pursued at least what he's saying there. Seeking pleasure in God. You see, to come out from under the fallen idea that other things are going to really satisfy us and ultimately arrive at the biblical truth that only God will satisfy us. Only God will give us true pleasure. (coughs) To call us to be worshiping and serving out of pleasure rather than mere duty. Again, this is its own topic, but I guess to help in our understanding, for those of you that are married, think of it in this way. Ask your wife, if she would rather you be faithful to her because it's your duty or because you want to. And then maybe she'll help you work through the question. It is a duty. But that shouldn't be the pinnacle of the reason that we do it. What do we take delight in? That's what we worship. And God indeed, as we will see here, is the only one who is worthy of being worshipped. Of being the one in whom we seek ultimate fulfillment. Ultimate joy. But all men are worshippers. It can't be denied. And so I submit to you secondly, If it is indeed true, as we've said firstly, that all men are worshipers, and yet we understand and we see quite plain before us that not all men worship and serve the one true God, then it's axiomatic to assert secondly then, there are many gods. Not true gods. Not the creator of the heaven and earth. But gods of our own making. Idols, false gods. And this, I say, is something that we can get tripped up in in our modern context. Somehow it is common for us to frame in our minds and our thinking that an idol is a physical object that some ancient or some pagan person has carved and puts on his mantle or in his home and bows down to, and that we're somehow, if we don't have images like that in our homes and in our lives, immune from the sin of idolatry. And it's just simply not the case. We, in our fallen state and with our sinful natures, can fashion and frame gods that aren't physically present and something that we put on a mantle, but they are things that we give ourselves to. It's easy to think of images as sinful and idolatrous. It's easy perhaps for us to think of open sinful practices as being idols that we can fall into and wrongly pursue in disobedience to our God. But in a setting such as this, of course, we need to dig deeper. We need to recognize and see how we might turn legitimate things into idols. It's tempting to frame a list of such things, but then as is always the case in making lists with regard to spiritual things, when are you finished? And the danger in making your list is somehow to think that you're finished. And then you miss the deeper reality underneath that we're such creative idolaters. We can't make a list and then check all of it and say, well, I'm not an idolater. I didn't do A, B, C, D, E, or F, or G. but we may have a host of other idols that we neglected to mention or remember. There are, I say, legitimate things. Again, I don't attempt to give a list or anything exhaustive, but just illustrations. I could speak about cars. I have a fondness for cars. 
If money were no object, we'd have a modest home and a massive warehouse somewhere full of cars, one for every mood. I wouldn't have many in there that are computerized. I'm going to rebel soon and start going backwards and rebuilding old cars. I like to do things instead of having the car do it for me, but I digress. I hope cars are not sinful in themselves. I arrived here in one today. I own two, well, portions of two. And the bank owns the other portions of those. But what about a job? I can go to the Scriptures and point out to you from several perspectives and several portions of the Bible how it would be sinful for you not to have a job. But yet, can I turn a job into an idol? Can that which is under God ordained for my good and the benefit of those under me and my family and all these other things, can I turn it into an idol? Well, of course. And I can't tell you where a line is. 40 hours a week is good. 42 is sinful. 50 is abominable. We can't go there. But I can say this. When you give more of yourself to a job than it should have, then it's become an idol. When it hinders you from giving of yourself to your God or to your loved ones, it's become an idol. And we can go on. You look through the Scripture, things we can't really quantify. What about success? Do you want to be successful? Or maybe it doesn't matter about that. Do you want to appear successful? You can turn that into an idol. I'm tempted to ask some of you history folks here to do some homework that I guess I'm too lazy to do, but... I wonder about sports, and I mention it from a historical context of, well, sports in the ancient world, and then sports in the modern world. You know, a lot of the things that are major sports today were only invented 100, maybe 150 years ago. What was going on culturally, spiritually, when sports kind of got elevated again? was going on in the ancient world when sports were so elevated. I'm not saying sports are wrong. Sports can be great. They can be helpful. I mean, beyond just mere exercise, but discipline, sportsmanship, character building, there's a whole lot of things good that can be drawn from the realm of sport. But I ask you, Does it take really a long glance in our culture today to understand that sports have become idolatrous? I mean, they don't seek to hide it. I'm not a lot of a sports guy, so maybe it's easy for me to preach this, but I remember years ago in the Jordan years of basketball, some of the commercials that were put on as you approach the finals, and they were using our words. Dedication. Reverence. I can't remember now, but I was stunned at some of the words they used very openly and positively about the game. Can we turn things into idols? Can we give more of ourselves to them than they should have? Let's dig deeper. Ecclesiastical status. Denominational position. Can we give more to that than we should? We can make gods out of anything. We, by our fallen nature, are bent toward 
idolatry. There are many gods. And I haven't scratched the surface in the few I've listed here today. Well, let me submit to you a third thought today. And that is this. Not all gods are equal. Not all gods are equal. We do not have time to turn it up, but I put before you today, maybe as a healthy thought for the new year, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I grew up in years where Ecclesiastes was ignored, and in the most popular study Bibles, you should probably just rip the introduction right out of that Bible when it came to the book of Ecclesiastes. Those days have changed somewhat. I recently saw a brother, Dr. Michael Barrett, and was, as I've done several times over the years, in trying to encourage him to put his work on Ecclesiastes into a little volume. And he said, well, you know, at the time... And actually, there's been a wealth of new stuff on Ecclesiastes in recent years. So, there you have it. But I remember sitting in class with him going through that book. What a book. What a book for an affluent society. What a man under God to write such a book. Solomon, who from an earthly perspective, from a human perspective, enjoyed and possessed more of earthly prosperity and earthly pursuits and earthly pleasures than any other man has or ever will. And God, under the inspiration of His Spirit, gave that man to write a book that said, I have put this to the test. I've put this to the test. I've put this to the test. And under the sun, all of it is vanity and vexation of spirit. It's chasing after the wind. You can't be fulfilled in any of it. What's he examine? He examines pleasure, sensuality, he examines wealth. He examines fame. He examines the accumulation of possessions. He even laments there, who am I going to leave them to? Maybe my son's an idiot. All of the problems, all the holes in these other idols. And the conclusion of the whole matter is this. They're empty. They can't satisfy. I don't know how many of you are wealthy or how many of you are worried about where the next paycheck will come from and what it will be. But you know, we have the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses. I think if you read Ecclesiastes, it might be that if you find yourself in a rat race trying to keep up with your neighbor and the things they bought or whatever else, I always like to say it's better instead of getting caught up trying to keep up with the Joneses, as it were, to go talk to the Joneses and find out how satisfied they are with all that stuff. And you might find the wealthiest person you could know or in this earth that would be honest enough to say, you know, it doesn't satisfy. Why is it that sinners, as they pursue sin, always go deeper and deeper into sin? Take perhaps one of the most prominent idols of our day, immorality and sensuality. Why does it go downward and then downward and then downward, ultimately to perversion? Because it doesn't satisfy. The physical pleasures of intimacy between a husband and wife can be eminently satisfying and fulfilling. When you haven't made a God out of it. You see, there's so many things under God and in their proper place that can bring a measure of fulfillment. It is biblical to take delight in the work of your hands. 
until you try and make it a God. You see, not all gods are equal. But the fallen mind refuses to believe that. The fallen mind, and in rebellion against the true God, seeks, and sometimes it flits from one God to another, to another, to another, never admitting that there's emptiness there. Not all gods are equal. And I just put before you Solomon's survey of the whole of life and the conclusion, if you don't know the true God, you're going to be miserable. But come with me to our last thought today, and that is this. Only the true God can satisfy only the true God can satisfy. Would you turn with me to the 13th verse of our reading? Here's what I put before you as our text today. The Lord through His prophet says, well, let's read the 12th verse as well. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Only the true God can satisfy. I think the inspired imagery of our text is striking. And it is perhaps one of the most helpful images with regard to idolatry. There's a sentence I didn't think through. An image with regard to idolatry. Work that one out. An illustration. What is a cistern? It's a vessel. It's a bowl. A jar. All it holds is what you bring to it. Now you think about that with regard to idolatry. All, all an idol has is what you bring it. You know, you could look at this and think this through and think, well, idolatry, our idols ultimately let us down, which is of course true. But if we engage in the fallen mindset, what we need to be even more convinced of is that our idols let us down when they succeed. Because that's all they can give us. And I say all an idol has is what you bring and you put in it. And if I could make this statement, and this is one I urge you to be very careful with. I'm a firm believer in the doctrine of total depravity, the doctrines of grace, and our ugliness and our sinfulness in ourselves, that even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, so I hope I'm persuading you I've not abandoned the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of depravity. But as we think of the created order, if we think of who and what God created us to be, created in His image, in worshiping Him, to be at His right hand, to, to rule over the rest of creation. Psalm 8. Idols aren't worthy of us. We weren't created for them. We were created for Him. And He is the only one that can satisfy. I don't like using trite phrases in the pulpit, but I'm going to repeat one because there's great truth in it. I've heard it said often, God created us with a God-shaped hole in our hearts that only He can fill. Well, 
If you flesh that out biblically, I'm happy enough with that trite statement. Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes 3 this way. It's translated in our authorized version, He hath put the world in our hearts. But the term there is actually the word for eternity. God has put eternity in our hearts. We're built with an understanding that there is more. That there's forever. That there's God. And when we forsake Him and turn to our cisterns, but you see, as we talked about the idol as a vessel, and it only has what we bring to it, here's where the illustration keeps bringing it on. It's worse than that. It's a broken vessel. So all the stuff we keep bringing to our idols and pouring in there is leaking out all the time. And we have to keep running back and forth to keep our idol full. It's because we don't admit we keep letting us down. The comparison here is between a broken vessel and a fountain of living waters. A supply that brings the water to us. That's the difference between the true God and idols. I was reading many years ago now something in Jonathan Edwards. And I remember the opening of the chapter. He made a statement. And it took me back. It took me back in such a way that I didn't agree with it. I thought, wow, I'm going to disagree with probably the greatest theological mind of our nation's history. But Edwards said something like this, when we get to heaven, we'll never fully know God. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I, I thought that's what heaven was all about. And even Paul speaking about us now seeing through a glass darkly, but then face to face. That we would fully know God in heaven. We're going to be not as we are now in His immediate presence where there's stuff in between, but in His immediate presence. But I read on. I didn't slam the book closed. And by the end of the chapter, not only did I agree, I was weeping. Because Edwards was working through the point that our God is infinite. There will never be a point in eternity when our God will have to look at us and say, I'm sorry. There's nothing more of me that I can share with you. Now we will, and if we enter into that realm where we, we, we just can't go there, if the capacities that God will grant unto us in our glorified state to soak in, and yet Him never run dry. Him never disappoint. Him never fail to satisfy. Only the true God can satisfy the soul. Now these are, I trust, basic, fundamental truths that I don't have to persuade you of today. It's pretty clear we're not to follow idols and we should worship the true God. But again, 
Do we recognize His worthiness? Are we captured by Him? Do we see in Him the only thing that can satisfy? Do we see in Him the only thing that brings worthy delight, that brings real pleasure? You see, when we think of hedonism so often, we're just thinking about warped, depraved pursuits after pleasures that don't satisfy. No, let us consider that at His right hand, He tells us, their pleasures forevermore. You see, this is deep theology, basic theology, and very practical at the same time. When you meet with temptation in this new year, as one has put it, I always get some of my bees confused. It may have been Brooks. It may have been Boston. I don't know. Meet every temptation with this phrase. The Lord is my portion. You think that through. Meet every temptation with the phrase. The Lord is my portion. What I have in Him, what I delight in in Him, will satisfy me forever. It will bring me joys even now to walk in obedience to Him. This pleasure is temporal, it is fleeting, and it's even going to bring me misery now in just a little while. The Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth, is my portion. When you can live there, you'll have power over the little thing, that shiny object that Satan is putting in front of you to trip you up. To understand, again, these basic things. All men are worshipers. We're built that way. There are many gods, false gods of our own fashioning and making, and we're most inventive at it. But not all gods are equal. Every other god is a broken cistern. Only the true God can satisfy. May God help us in this year to heed what the Apostle John put in the close of his epistle. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's bow our heads together. Our Heavenly Father, we pause again as we acknowledge You in this place, and we ask for the help of Your Spirit. Lord, there are spiritual things that we've discussed today. And the struggle may be different for each of us. And yet the answer is the same. Fix our eyes upon You. Lord, cause us rejoicing in the Gospel of Your Son. Let us be overwhelmed afresh with Your beauty, with Your worthiness, and the emptiness of anything we would seek to put in Your place. So by Your Spirit, work in us to see You as You are and to delight in our own fountain of living We pray and ask these things in Jesus' worthy name.